All right, let's get let's go ahead and get started. Um, hi everyone, thanks for joining us here at Algolia for another tech lunch. For those of you that don't know, this is a recurring series that we do to bring the community together and talk about various things in the industry. Uh, I'm Elizabeth Sankey. I'm a product manager at Algolia focusing on analytics. And I'm joined here by three panelists who are going to talk us through the very exciting world of product management. So if you would like to go ahead and introduce yourselves and tell us a little bit about your background, that'd be great. Uh, my name is Pierre Nicolas. I'm a product manager. I lead our, uh, the development of a new product at uh, Credio, a marketing company. And my product is focusing on creating mouse traffic uh, to our clients who are e-com uh, companies uh, to the site. Hi, my name is Louis Lecat. Um, I'm the head of product here at Argoria, so I lead PM, product design, user research. I'm here in Paris, but I've actually spent most of my career in San Francisco, just relocating myself at the beginning of the year. And I had the chance to get into PM at a really small startup that was like five people, and I kind of like was the first PM over there and we grew and grew and grew and that's where, where I kind of like learned the ropes of the job and then most recently I worked for Asana, uh, company in the project management software space in San Francisco still where first I led the performance teams and then started the team around the core product experience. I don't think your mic's on. Better. So Emmanuel Ozanski, lead PM at Mano Mano. We are uh, a marketplace uh, dedicated to home improvement, uh, gardening, etc. And I'm leading one of the three tribes, uh, which is called the Find Tribe, which basically is dedicated to helping our users find the products they need. So everything from onboarding the sellers to helping the user add the product to its cart. Previously, I was working, uh, I joined uh, Wind, which is another startup, French startup, uh, when they were 20, a little bit less than 20 people. And this is where I started working in, in product. Amazing, thanks. Um, so this is gonna be a panel, it's gonna be a little bit of a conversation, uh, and we will definitely save some time at the end for Q&A. Um, to get us started, it would be great if you could take us through what your definition of product management is. It's a really broad question, but it looks a lot different to a lot of different people. So whoever wants to jump in, go ahead. Okay. Um, so it's a, it's a broad question. Um, I think the, the definition that strikes me the most, and it's the one that I've read the most when I, were, when I was considering becoming a product manager was that the, the role of a product manager is to discover and deliver a product that is use, uh, usable, feasible, and valuable. And I think it's interesting because it, it encompasses two things that, are that is very important for product management, which is one, there's two big phases, which are delivery and discovery, discovery and delivery. Uh, and one cannot go without the other. And the fact that the product management role is really at the center and has very close relationship with UX, business, and tech. And this is why the product needs to be usable, feasible with tech, and valuable with business. So that's the one that strikes me the most. So I, c I couldn't agree more with what you just said. My, my answer w would have been, but I think you just gave it. It's, it's to me, the, the way I like to think about it is the mission of the PM is to deliver the best product for the right user, right? And the, the three key parts is the right user, is make sure you're solving for the right person. Is it like enterprise, is it B2C? Within the enterprise, you have multiple users, you have a buyer, a user, and all that. There is the right product, which is, okay, how do you discover and create and design the product that really solves the problems that you've identified? And then there's deliver, right? We're really accountable and in charge, and we work hand in hand with the engineering team to deliver the product, right? And so to me, PM is really the, the art and science of marrying those three and making that happen. So 100% aligned with you. <laughs> Anything to add? I'm gonna add some cynicism on top of that. Um, Go for it. <laughs> I'll say that part of the job of the PM is to say what you said, uh, which is to 
create a reality around the job that we do. Uh, but in the words you've, you've, you've used, those jobs have been around forever, right? Uh, PM is fairly new, and I think it's worth questioning why that is. I think some things have changed in how work is organized in general. I think some things have changed in where we think value is going to come from. Uh, some things have changed with the users, for example. I think we think we talk about users differently uh, from how we talked about users, let's say, 30 years ago. And I also think we have an expectation that a lot of value is going to come from computer sciences in general. Um, some of it is going to be usability, but I'm going to lump it with computer sciences. And uh, and I think this is how really product, why product management came to be as a as a role. That's my that's my view. So that's a lot of it is post rationalization. Uh, we, we try and come up with words that describe what we do. Um, I think as a generation, we've been influenced by how specific companies have worked, how they've built themselves, how they decided what mattered and what did not, uh, of course, by contrast. And I think this is why Product Manager came to be. But uh, if I go back to the cynicism I mentioned at the beginning, I think most of what relies on the PM's shoulders is to decide what's hard in what's at hand. Uh, sometimes it's going to be uh, an engineering problem, and actually most of their job is going to be to work with engineering. Sometimes it's going to be a marketing issue, uh, and then marketing, well, you, you, go, you get what I'm getting. Um, but it's, um, I think it's good to have this roadmap that you mentioned to, to think about it in the abstract and think, OK, I'm a product manager now. What does it mean? Um, it means you probably are going to have to do each of those things, but not necessarily at the same time and not necessarily with the same focus. Um, you're going to need to play to the strengths of your team and need to play to the strengths of what your company already is. Yeah, I would I would add to that that this is kind of why we exist in a way, right? But then what you do is so different versus different day to day. It's different company to company, and it's different depending on the project you have, right? And and in some cases, I think it's you know when you're doing something really technical and and really the crux of the problem is here, someone might kind of wear the PM hat of defining what we need to do and why we need to do it, but they might not even be called a PM. Absolutely, but I guess, and, and, and this is very true, I, I still think there is something peculiar about even having to ask what a job is, right? 95% of jobs out there, you just know what they are, and you don't need to be told, and people don't disagree about it. <laughs> uh, and, and we're in that, you know, it's an interstitial space, right, where we are kind of in between, and it's uncomfortable, but it's also fine. Um, why do you think that's the case? That what did we? Why are we in that that part of the five percent of jobs that are undefined? All right. So part of it is I think we are a bit full of ourselves. <laughs> we we'll, we like to think we can do everything. Um, so I think we we got the luxury of not pinning ourselves down to something. Um, but also because we work in a space where we can do that as groups, right? We can decide. We can work on something new, uh, change it if it doesn't work. That's that's a luxury. I think that's part of it, right? The cashier doesn't get to decide, okay, my cashier job is going to change. Uh, as, as a PM, we, we have some leeway to do that uh, and then get some convincing and so on, but at least you have a path to, to making it your job change. I think that's part of it. Um, and I think the other part is a lot of what we do and has to do as, you, you know, we, we look at what others are doing, are doing. This is why we're here, which is why we think it's valuable to come together and discuss this. And Sometimes someone is going to come up and do something completely different, and we're going to have to, you know, again post-rationalize. What is it that this guy who doesn't do at all what we did had any success? And then we're going to say, well, it's because it cannot be defined. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah. And I like. And there, there's one thing I really like, which say, which goes like, the first job of the PM is to define the PM's job. You know, and like every time you get to a new company, that's really your first job is okay, where do you fit in there? So, so that really resonates. I mean, you, uh, you talked a little bit about it, but it, I feel it really, really depends on the context, what you are expected to do and what the role you take. Uh, I mean, we've all been in very different kind of companies, different kind of customers. I think the, the PM role is really, really different from one company to another. That's the perfect transition to my next question. Um, so it sounds like 
product management can look very different depending on where you are and who you are. Um, so what does it currently look like for you at your given organization? Um, how big's the team? How's the product broken down? What does that look like for you? I'm gonna even one dimension to what you said. It also depends on when we are. Um, I, I'm working at a company, Critio, um, that has been around for some time now, that has grown a very, very successful product. And depending on which phase you're in as a company and as a product, you need different things and you need different organizations. Um, so for example, we're, right now we're organized uh, across product units that encompass both uh, product people and uh, commercial people uh, in order to focus on the right problems. Uh, so we segmented that in different ways, but you're gonna have PMs, for example, that uh, answer to business people. Uh, we call them general managers. And, uh, and we structure ourselves this way. There's no CPO, for example, at, at Critio right now. There was one in the, in the past, and we thought it was relevant, but right now we do not. So um, at Mano Mano, again, we, we also grew very quickly. I joined one year and a half, and we were only four PMs. Uh, today we have 18, 18 feature teams, so 18 PMs plus lead PMs and a, and a CPO. We do have a CPO. Uh, the way we are organized is interesting because the product uh, organization is basically uh, reflected in the whole company's organization. Uh, we will talk maybe about it later, but we have company goals. And for each company goals, we have uh, kind of business units that are responsible for those company goals. And attached to those business units, we have a tribe, basically, a product team, uh, with all of the different feature teams that are working towards this company goal. Uh, so this is basically the kind of the way we are organized. And of course, we have a, a design team also linked to the, to the product team and a QA team also. So on our side, we're still uh, fairly flat. So we currently have eight PMs, uh, each working on their own area of the product from insights and analytics to the crawler to maybe the libraries to using machine learning to augment the product and all that. And so each PM is really working with their squad and like empowered to drive uh, their own area. Um, we're growing fast, I guess, good segue, but I'm sure you've seen the news, we just raised 110 million. Uh, we're gonna grow the team a lot next year. If you're looking for a PM job, come talk to me, please. <laughs> uh, but yeah, and and um, and the way we're organized now is for sure gonna evolve because the organization's gonna change, the needs of the organization is gonna change. We're probably going to introduce some structure, maybe kind of like you guys in the future. We also, need to be thinking about how that relates to the product design and the engineering organization mm -hmm. uh, so that people can have the right counterparts. Yeah. Um, Pierre, I just wanted to ask a quick follow-up. So you mentioned that the structure has totally changed um, and you had a CPO because at the time it made sense. According to you, what, what needs of the company drove the decision to change the structure of the product team and, and how was that transition? I think we identified that there was a lot of layering uh, between what we worked on as a company and what our clients were becoming or who we wanted our clients to be. Um, and we wanted to get faster to the truth. Um, we, I think we're committed as a group to this iteration process. And when you realize that one loop of the process takes six months, you know something's broken and you want to fix that. So. By be, you know, bringing the layers closer together. They're still here, we still have the layers, but at least they answer to the same person. Uh, they have to be accountable for the six months loop and make it a much, much, much tighter loop. So that's why it led, what led to change. Uh, another aspect was to say that actually we have right now, they're not conflicting, they're not incompatible, but they are adjacent projects. Uh, they don't, address the same people, they don't have the same problems, and lumping them together sometimes can create confusion and then can create bottlenecks. So by separating them, which is you know, very crude but very effective technique, uh, you can really get faster in that regard. Just, just a follow-up. Um, 
but I think you pretty much answered it right now. But how how does the global vision of the company, product-wise, uh, does it still exist? Is there still a global product vision, or is it just projects, adjacent projects? No, there is one um, that is that I think has two large benefits to it. The first one is that it's very broad um, and gives us a lot of regal room to work and to build new things and not limit ourselves to the current work streams. So, so and the vision to share it with you and you'll see it's broad. It's to be the, the leading platform for the advertising platform for the open internet. Uh, so you'll see at the end there's a dig to see the gaffes <laughs> um, that's intentional. Uh, so that helps us position ourselves, remind ourselves of what we are up against, remind ourselves of also the fact that they are very close, but it means they are also only on their space primarily. Um, and we can use that to our advantage. That's the, that's the benefit of that vision. Um, now, we ensure that business uh, units, uh, product units, sorry, uh, still comply with that general vision. Uh, I'd say for us, it's more of a compass uh, than it is, for example, a goal to, to separate the two. I think goal are more refined. The vision is broader, but it's it's a north star we can we can look at and we, and remind ourselves. Okay, are, am I truly open? For example, am I am I truly for the open internet right now with what I'm building? If I'm not, then probably I need to talk to some people <laughs> and 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 figure out whether I'm you know I've lost course or if I need to change the vision. I don't think I will. Cool. Um, so Emmanuel and Louis, you, you already both touched on this a little bit, but I'd love to get a little bit more into how product managers at your organization work with design and engineering. You both mentioned those two functions. Um, we talked a little about, about larger structure, but on a more day-to-day -day basis, who are PMs at your org working with and how does, what does that look like? Um, so, so really, we try at Algolia. We try to strive for the model of like the the empowered product team. Uh, we call them squads here, and so we try to have a squad with a PM, a product designer, if there's design needs on what we're doing here, and uh, engineers. And and I say engineers at large, but sometimes it can be data scientists, it can be data engineers, it can be more like back end, front end skills, depending on the needs, right? Uh, but the goal is really to build teams with the right set of skills and really empowered to create their own goal and create their own roadmap towards those goals and then go after those goals, right? Um, this is always work in progress. Like we're never ready. We don't always have exactly the right resources. Sometimes we can't have like a full-time designer on the team. Sometimes we don't have enough PMs to cover all the teams and all that. So I also don't want to sell like the world is perfect and we always have it figured out, right? Um, but I think the in, in my experience, you can only really build great software if you really have a few people with the right skills and they're empowered, right? If there's anything that comes kind of like top down, oh, we should be doing this feature or this thing or all that, and, and that's too low level, that's really disempowering for the teams. And that's generally not good because when it comes from the top, when it comes from someone else, there are people who know the technology less, who know the constraints less, and know the customers less, right? And so I really expect that the people on the squad, uh, especially the PM, to be the expert in their own area and to know, you know, if you're working on like insights, for instance, uh, I know it's, that's Elizabeth's role at Algolia, right? I know Elizabeth knows way more about our customers' needs and pain points around our insights and analytics platform than I ever will, right? And I want that, and that's a good thing, right? So it's important that Elizabeth's empowered to kind of like drive the roadmap here. So basically at Mano Mano, we have the same challenges and the same solutions. So we are, we also have empowered feature teams. So we have a PM with uh, the, everyone that's uh, needed to build the actual products, so uh, front, back-end developers, um, of course, UX when it's needed, uh, data scientists in the feature team, um, QA, etc. So basically, we really work the same way, uh, and we've also built our process uh, regarding roadmap building, etc., to give 
the most power to the to the to the PM in order to for them to be able to build actually what they know is the right product. Uh, so yeah, I think we're in the same direction. Me personally, I've barely worked with designers uh, since I've been with Scredio, but some others do. Um, they're not here, so I'm not going to answer for them. And in my current role, I work primarily with uh, marketing and, and sales. But in my previous roles, I've worked with um, engineering quite a bit. And actually, I'm going to change the word and not just say engineering, say R&D. Um, we have a, a strong culture that incorporates both uh, very science-y aspect of things, the research and, and development and the engineering and the implementation of the, the insights we can find and, and how those two play together. Um, and in those areas, I'd say that the PM's role primarily is to ensure focus because you can easily uh, get sidetracked or focus too much on a, on a, on a problem that, that exists but is not key to what it is we're trying to do right now. Um, That's number one. And number two, find new uses for what you discover in the process. Um, I'd say, uh, and, and a lot of it has been written about the discovery process. Uh, a lot of it is accidental. Someone's going to tell you something when they don't necessarily mean it, but it gives you an idea. Or someone was looking for something and found something else. I think you, you need to be tuned to pick up those things because sometimes the people who actually work on them don't um, and try and turn them uh, into something. Um, I'll give you a simple example. Uh, a few years ago, I was working on a on a technology that's tasked with interfacing with big exchanges that sell uh, inventory, uh, so that's placements on uh, sites for to show ads in real time. And the engineering team was very frustrated uh, with the fact that each of our partner had a different API, right? And uh, and at first, you can just listen to that problem and say, okay, they're going to find a, a way to solve it internally, and they're going to build an abstraction and a DSL that ensures that you can process that. But one of the things that, as a PM, you should listen and say, is there any value to those being differentiated? Should we work on standardization as an industry and not just within our walls? And I think this is the kind of thing that you need to be attuned to, uh, to listen to. I I actually think my answer is incomplete, and so I want to add to that, because part of your question was, who do PMs work with? And so I've kind of like mentioned the squads and how we structure the team, but on a day-to-day -day basis, that's really kind of like only half of who you interact with. I think the most important for a PM to really bring value is to be front-facing with the market, right? And when I say the market, I mean custom existing customers, I mean prospects, I mean users. Uh, because that's how you bring value to the team, right? So it's kind of like part of your job is like execution, but that's almost like the easy part of the job in my mind. Uh, but the part where you really, really bring value to the team is r really representing the, the customer problems, right? And so, and I mentioned customers and, and prospects. That also goes with like working with like your customer success team and your sales team and the support team and anybody who's front facing customers and user every single day of their jobs. Yeah, that's a good, I have a follow-up to that. I mean, Louis just answered it, but for the two of you, what does, how do you, how do you get customer feedback um, at your various orgs and? Yeah, being B2C, having millions of daily active users, it's probably not the same way that you get feedback from your, we cannot interview just millions of, uh, of users every day. Um, but we do, well, basically, we, we focus on two main things for user feedbacks, on quantitative, quantitative uh, feedbacks. Basically, we have like a great data infrastructure with the uh, amplitude, etc., which give us a lot of insights in terms of what our users are actually doing, where are they dropping, what are... So a lot of, in, of customer insights come from uh, amplitude or, or jar with video session regarding, um, etc. And we also have a user research team which works on also more qualitative uh, user research uh, where we will do surveys, uh, interviews. Uh, we have a, a user club uh, and PMs can, like every week, can call a few, a few users just to get some qualitative uh, feedback on their part of the product. For us, I think I'll separate two things. 
because you said feedback, but I think you meant user voice in general, right? Uh, but some of it is feedback in the sense that you've presented them with something and they're going to respond. Uh, either it's an existing product that you're already selling, or pitching, or, or it's something that's a form, more or less formed idea that you're presenting to them and they're going to react to it. I think this one is the easy part. Um, some of it's going to come naturally, some of it, you, because you have something in your hand, it's easy to bring to them and get them to respond. I think the hard part is getting to the abstract and the ethereal and, and you, you just want to know what their problems are and you get to them and you say, what's your problem? And they say, I don't have a problem. Um, and, and then you need to still try and spark a dialogue about their problems. And I, I'm not going to pretend we solve this one at all. Um, I think it happens right now a bit too much by happenstance, I will say. Um, I think we're trying to organize it better. But uh, we're a 3,000 co uh, person company. Uh, so it's a, it's a tough thing to, to, to figure out and get to the bottom of, uh, especially when you factor in um, that we're global. Um, I've tried asking a Japanese person what their problem was. Did not go very well the first time. The second time I asked a Japanese person to ask that. Um, but it, it's a it's an it's a never-ending challenge, and I think uh, when we change our org, we were also saying right now it doesn't work. The six-month loop it's not okay. Uh, we want a much tighter loop. So we're in the process of re rediscovering the wheel, uh, which is how do you talk to your customers in an effective way? And I'll tell you in a couple of months. Cool. Um, so this kind of ties into, you just mentioned that you realized that there was something wrong and you wanted to fix it. Um, how, respectively, at your organizations or even within your own team, do you measure the success of your product and the decisions that you make? Okay. Um, so, so basically, we measure success at different levels. Um, the first and the, like the highest level is, uh, I've already talked about the company goals. So we have company goals and key results uh, attached to those company goals. Uh, these are like the main metrics that we, as a company, all need to follow and we need to uh, understand the, the, the way they, they evolve. So basically it's like NPS, uh, conversion rate, etc. So big uh, macro uh, uh, metrics. And then uh, at the team level, uh, it's quite hard to understand your impact on those very macro uh, uh, metrics. For instance, if you look at the NPS, well, you can. There's a lot of things that can improve the NPS. It's very hard for a team to understand what part they actually had in moving the the metric up or down. Uh, so we we introduce uh, well North Star metrics by teams, which are uh, metrics that are more actionables, one that you can follow over a quarter, and you can actually. Well, for those that are customer facing, uh, you can A/B test and you can understand exactly what was your impact on this uh, on this metric. But these are the main two ways we actually measure success. Uh, yeah, I mean we have a pretty similar setup here. Uh, we kind of have yearly goal for the company that's kind of like everybody knows about, and then each team does their own OKRs for the quarter, and. Again, what you care about is at the end of the day, how you're helping the business, right? And so it might be, hey, we're doing this feature because it's making us more competitive in the market. And so we're going to close more of these deals or it's going to allow us to upsell more of these deals or reduce churn. You know, there's always, you kind of like always want to tie back to that. To that. Now, now, truth is when you're a, a product engineering team, what you're doing this quarter uh, you're not going to see the impact right now uh, because a lot of those metrics, if you measure it, if I think about churn, they're both like, they're a lagging indicator of what you're doing. And, uh, and again, there's so many things that play into them, which could be like, you know, the, the sales team just restructures itself and we change the message and all that. So it's not just your feature, right? So what uh, you try to do in this case is look for kind of a leading indicator. And, and I like to think of them as like input metrics and output metrics. Like the output metric is eventually what you want to improve, maybe like want to reduce churn maybe. And the input metric might be, you know, I'm like, we have the hypothesis that um, when people use this feature that we're building, they become more engaged with the product, which results in less churn. 
and what we're measuring is just like the engagement on this feature, right? So like getting adoption on that feature. Uh, and that's really, really, really different depending on each squad, depending on what you're working on, right? We have teams, we have infra teams working kind of like on really like the back end and everything that happens below the hood at Algoria. And then they're not thinking about their OKRs the same way that uh, maybe teams that build customer facing features do. For, for the product I work on right now, the single KPI is revenue. Um, it's a simple one. Uh, but every product is a different I'm one. Jealous. Hmm? I'm jealous. Well, don't be. Uh, because it's intellectually confusing. Uh, no, no, actually, let's talk about that. Um, revenue is misleading. It doesn't have the longer term aspect that NPS can, can give you. It, 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 it has a lot of holes. Um, and still, you need to pick one. Right. This is basically what it comes down to. And, and we decided to pick revenue because we thought, and I think this is true, uh, still true, we thought we are honest people. We will take care of the rest, even if it's not a KPI. Uh, and we do. But when I say don't, is that you're always under suspicion <laughs> when your uh, KPI is revenue. Because people will say, are you betting the farm on something that's going to blow up? Uh, we do not, but uh, but it's you know almost always against theirs. Um, in the past, I've worked on on more specific pieces, and uh, they were soothing because they had a uh, a KPI that was so close to what we were actually building, and so in such a small loop, right? If your objective is to uh, I don't, I don't want to get too technical, but if, if it's move a technical metric, most of the time you have an ent entire control over this. It's going to be about how creative you can be in finding ideas to move that metric. But when it does move, you're going to know it's entirely thanks to you, and, and people will know that. When revenue moves, people are going to go, well, maybe it's just Christmas, and people want to buy more stuff. Uh, and, and they're not wrong entirely. Uh, but, but you still want to be proud, proud of that and say, Sure, I'm going to account for the Christmas effect, but still, my product kills. Makes sense. And I want to tie that back to something you said earlier about you know wanting to tighten up your product development cycle. I'm, in, I'm curious to know from the three of you what the relationship is between planning, executing, and measuring. What do those three levers look like when to you when the product development cycle is healthy, I guess? This is very deep into sausage making. Uh, I guess the answer is if people are not sick, it works. Um, so the, the planning, uh, I think, is something that we keep coming back to, is are we planning at the right um, time horizon? Uh, the product I work on is only a year old. So the time horizon is pretty tight. Uh, a lot of things can change in, in, in even a month uh, when you're a year-old product. Uh, some other components or products within Credio obviously are not a year-old, obviously don't have the same timelines, and you're talking about multi-quarter projects. So so you, want, you need to be able to call, toggle that, and the problem is you're fighting for shared resources that have their own timeline. So it's, it's a bit of a mess, and, and, it's, and, and we make it work, but I wouldn't be able to tell you how. The executing is much more tightly defined. And this, the, because the metric for the timeline is set and is not negotiable, it's the quarter. 80% of our R&D teams have quarterly OKRs. Our salespeople have quarterly targets. So this is their timeline, and there's no going around it. And it's fine, right? You, you can comply with that, and that gives you a sense of what you can execute and how you make your, your chunks so that they fit within that more or less awkwardly. So this one is, is fairly easy to transition. Once, you've, once you're done with the planning and you figure out your own shit, you can get to the quarter uh, aspect. And then the measuring, um, I think we're lucky enough to have a very uh, strong data infrastructure because it's core to what we do. And so a lot of what we do is easily, and I almost want to almost want to say by design, uh, measurable uh, in an A-B test and the impact on the revenue and the bottom line. So that's uh, something we can rely on and gives us a sense of where we are. It's more of a challenge for the projects like the one you mentioned, where, for example, you want to impact churn. Churn is a longer term type of uh, metric. It's harder to parse why someone left 
uh, your business and went somewhere else, if they even went somewhere else. Um, and this one, I think like most businesses, we're struggling to capture and we rely on our network of business people on the ground to give us a sense of where we are. So I think we're pretty close. We also have uh, a quarterly process to basically define the big chunks, our like the big priorities, and the idea is that during this quarter we want the, the teams to be as autonomous to decide what they will do on well basically two week sprints uh, cycles uh, and don't have to defocus for any like reprioritization etc. So the idea is that we we get the prioritization at the quarterly uh, level. We set the OKRs for engineering, uh, product, and well, business teams uh, based on this. And then the, the teams can just uh, deliver on, on this uh, prioritization. Uh, and I agree also on the, on the, on the measuring cycle. Uh, it's a big, big question. For instance, if you look at uh, NPS, does it make sense to look at it daily and say, oh, well, it went down today. Um, same, but the same for like very, if you look at the conversion rate, or uh, which is like one main metrics for every e-commerce website, basically it can depend a lot on season, weather, uh, what happened last year. Uh, so, so the 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 way today we we look at it is we try not to look at it under a week. So we just measure week on week evolutions, and we try to actually go deep every quarter to understand what's the, the evolutions. And we have the same kind of, uh, of, uh, of challenges with more longer uh, time period uh, uh, KPIs such as repeat or, uh, NP or even NPS, which where you, the, the, the impact comes quite a lot after the actual input. So same, same challenges. In terms of, I mean, in, in terms of processes, it sounds like we're very similar too. So we have, uh, we do quality planning, we set quality OKRs and teams are kind of like, they, they both kind of like set their own goals and, and get a checkpoint on that and then execute on those. Um, we actually have a, our process is something called planning week, like first week of the quarter where like, it's kind of like a week where all the teams get, you get to step back and be like, okay, what are we gonna do for the next three months? How do we measure that? What are the dependencies we might have with different teams? Uh, getting a checkpoint with, with your stakeholders. Maybe you have like a salesperson that that's representing kind of the market for you, the leadership and all that. Um, one challenge that uh, you constantly have is how much you should be planning versus executing, right? Um, when you're planning too much, you're not moving fast enough. And then when you're always executing, you're in this world where like, you're always like head under the water and like trying to move as fast as possible, but you, you don't think enough about where you, you're going. And I, th I think this one, there is no right answer. Every company I've been at has kind of like struggled with that and has tested different things. Uh, so it's a constant battle. One thing I would add in terms of planning is, you know, we're really talking about the, the quarter level, which is how we really measure and kind of like what we commit to. Um, but what's really important, and especially for a PM, is to think through, yes, you're planning for this quarter, but it's not like your vision stops in three months, right? Like you're building a brand new product, you didn't go into it a year ago thinking, okay, I'm thinking about the first three months and that's it, right? You kind of have a vision for what this product might become, where it fits in the market, you don't know all the answers and you're probably gonna pivot a bunch of times and, and learn as you go, but you're still leading with like, you know, we've, and, and you were telling me before, right before the, uh, the, the panel, you were saying like, we, we have all of this data, it's really valuable, we know we can like bring value to customers and you have a, a bunch of like assumptions, hypotheses that you're leading with, right? And so when I think about planning, you're really, you're planning and as a PM, you're often time, so I, I guess for you, it's maybe longer term, but as a PM on the squad, you're probably planning like nine months or a year out, you kind of have some vision of where you're gonna take your scope but then every quarter you kind of like, it's kind of like step back, okay, where kind of where am I on this vision? Do we still agree on the vision? Do we need to refine it? And then where do we want to get to in the next three months, right? Where, where are we now? Where do we want to get to, right? But it's not like your vision stops there. Uh, I'll add one thing to that. Um, 
I think I, I, I try to constantly have two visions for the product. One of them is what it could be, and the other one is it being in a dumpster. Um, and I, th I think thinking about what failure looks like is sometimes as efficient as thinking about success. Uh, I also told you earlier that the good thing is where my product is right now is that it's turning a profit. So it's always a good thing to have when your objective is revenue. Um, but I, I think we also need to be cognizant that it's not entirely what I what I want. If I if I have a product that makes money but it's in insignificant for the company's bottom line because of where we are right now, uh, we're not an SMB anymore. We we are a publicly traded company. We're not expected to just barely move the needle. So so the ambition must be big, and and the alternative is always the dumpster. If it just doesn't pan out, we'll need to be. You know, take it to the to the back and shoot it in the head. All right, some great imagery there. Um, <laughs> um, changing changing gears a little bit, we've talked a lot about strategy and we've gotten deep into how the sausage is made. Um, are there any particular tools or pieces of technology that are really important to how you do your job? Excel and Slack. The rest, I don't need it. Yeah, yeah I'm not, uh, I, I generally don't like to think of tools as themselves. They always kind of like serve a need and depending on what you're trying to do, you use different tools. So I mean, definitely live in Slack. Uh, we use Asana quite a bit and, and I come from the company. So that's definitely a tool that I uh, cheer on and enjoy using. Um, and then, yeah, I mean, Google Slides, Google Docs, spreadsheets, um, talking to people. Um, I think the one that most impacted the way the product team work was Amplitude. I've already talked about it. It really changed the way we... Amplitude. The way we look at customer insights. Uh, I mean, for e-commerce and B2C-facing companies, it's always a a very complex thing to really track most of what our users are doing on the website and try to catch the insights that are hidden in there. Uh, that's the one that mostly changed uh, the way we work. We also introduced a few tools to really try to better understand uh, what our users uh, qualitatively are uh, doing on the website. So we use Hotjar, which also really kind of kickstart our user research uh, culture. Very cool. Um, switching gears again a little bit. We talked earlier in this conversation about what product management is and how sort of teams are structured and, and where the product manager lies. Um, this is another broad question, but according to you, what makes for a successful product manager? What are the skills either learned or earned um, that makes for a, a good product manager? Okay, so the, the way we think about it at Argolia is um, you need empathy. Like to me, empathy is a really, really big one. You need to be able to understand and empathize with problems and pains that people who are not like you have, right? Uh, you need ownership because at the end of the day, you're accountable for it, delivering results and whatever it takes, whether it's like your deep uh, work, you're in deep working with the engineering team or you're working with the sales team or the leadership, like whatever it takes, right? You need to be strategic and have business sense. Uh, and when, when I say strategic, is really like being con being able to frame like what's your ecosystem, what's your competition, who, do you, who might you partner with, where you want to compete, not compete. And business sense is really like, at the end of the day, we serve the company's mission and the company has goals. And so we really want to build something towards that, right? That's kind of like how we've, well, I, I guess I would add the last one is communication and collaboration, which is more of like in service of the rest in a way. Uh, you need to be able to clearly structure what you're saying and follow that and collaborate effectively with all the constituents that work with you. Yeah, so uh, I, I completely agree on all those skills. I think just one, the one that for me kind of encompasses everything is being, a, so you, communication skills, basically. Uh, I think that as a, as a PM, you really need to be able to, well, communicate 
and listen to your users really efficiently. That's more empathy than communication, but uh, still, you need to be able to talk efficiently with all of your stakeholders, uh, understand their needs, their actual needs, or they being able to, I mean, it's a bit uh, uh, a cliche, but uh, being able to say no, again, it's a uh, part of the, of the job and it's really a communication skills in the end. Um, and being able to sell your vision to the whole company, to your team, being able to lead your team mostly relies on your communication with the team. So I think the one that really encompasses everything for me is being able to communicate efficiently on the different levels that you're expected to. Uh, I'm going to try and be, uh, uh, let's say, relevant to what I said earlier about uh, what I think about product management. Uh, I, I think a good PM is a PM that gets promoted. Uh, and it's handy, uh, but I, I really think that's what it is. Uh, it, it means that collectively we think that person is doing something right, uh, and that what and how we've determined that is very liquid. Um, and, and so that's why I focus on this now. The other question is how do you get promoted? It's, it's going to depend. Uh, there's a cynical answer, of course, which is to suck up to your boss. Uh, and then there's a more refined and complex answer, which is do whatever it takes to make your product work. And and here we go back to everything we've said, and, and we can define it after the fact. It, do you sell? It, does it sell? It's, it's almost as unfair as the revenue metric. Uh, in some cases, you're going to get promoted just because your company's growing. Good job, I guess. <laughs> uh, maybe you have nothing to do with that. Uh, but in general, as a PM, I think what you should strive towards is really define it in your own terms for yourself first, and it's a lot of soul searching and kumbaya, but then you implement it in the real world with the tools we've discussed, and I think all of these are very good uh, methods, and some of them are going to apply some places and some others won't. Uh, and I think it's the only thing I like about a phrase that some of you may have heard, which is that a PM is a CEO of, a, of the product. Has anyone heard that by show of hand? Okay, so it's complete and utter bullshit, but <laughs> some of the, something in it is interesting, is that some CEOs are, you know, psychopaths, and some PMs can be psychopaths and be successful, right? That exists. Uh, so it, it's going to be about the context of the firm you're in. Does it need you to be cutthroat? Does it need you to be uh, friendly? I think uh, we are in companies that have more friendly edge to them, but not all companies are like that. Uh, so I think we're friendly people. I find you friendly. Um, <laughs> there it is. I told. I said it. Um, and and in some other companies, PMs are assholes. I've I've met some, you know, world class assholes, uh, and it works great for them. They're VPs, so they're doing something right wherever it is they are. Very clear. Um, <laughs> so we mentioned we mentioned. Some skill. I mean, we mentioned a bunch of skills. We just listed off a bunch of skills and, and values to have. Is there anything that, what for you comes from experience and what can be taught or self-taught? Yeah, take, the, take away the I'm mic. Yeah. <laughs> um, to me, empathy is the one that's really hard to teach. I think it's it's one where when you have someone who kind of like does everything right, but really struggles to like feel other people's emotions and all that, I, I'm not sure, I don't know how to teach that, right? Um, I think the rest, like strategic focus on outcomes, you can teach collaboration, definitely communication, a bit harder, but can be coached. Uh, so yeah, empathy to me is the, the tough one. Yeah, I, I agree. I feel that most of it I, I learned by just doing. Um, empathy, I think you, you need to have some kind of curiosity and like, uh, I think you can learn how to be more empathic, uh, empathetic or, and can learn how to better understand your customers, but you need to have this first uh, empathy to, to, to begin with and you need to be, to be passionate about it and try to make it live. Anything to add? You, you may have gathered that I'm a very optimistic person. Um, no, actually, I think most of that... I, I kind of disagree on the empathy piece, even. I would say that you can teach that. Well, actually, perhaps you cannot teach that, but you can learn that, which is slightly different. Uh, 
I, I don't. You think gotta I, teach me though, because I need that. I well, <laughs> uh, I think any. I mean, uh, it's about the resources you're gonna put in to to learn that, and it's about what you're missing right now and right then. What I will say about my path is that I started as a person that was sure about everything, and I'm now sure of nothing. Uh, but it, but I'm in a better place, and I can actually function. Um, I think realizing those things and, and the difference between what the science tells you and what the engineering tells you in everything we do is super helpful. I think what I try to tell my team at least is keep reading stuff that are extremely abstract to the point they make you dizzy uh, and, and look for what they tell you in the world around you and whether it makes sense. Uh, I think it does two things. First, it can give you ideas even if you don't find them around you. Maybe you can make them be around you. Um, a, a, or it can teach you about how to influence the things that you see around you. Uh, I'll, I'll give you an example. Um, there's a there's an economic theory. Uh, when well it's not theory actually, it's very experimental. Uh, it's about how you if I give you a hundred bucks and I ask you to divide them between Manuel and yourself, and I tell you Manuel you can either accept the money that Louis is giving you or reject it. But if you reject it, none of you gets anything. You ever heard about this one? The science not sorry. The experiment tells us that. Most of the time, people will refuse the deal. Emmanuel will refuse the deal if Louis offers less than 30 bucks. It's, it's interesting because it bakes in a lot of stuff. It's irrational in the sense that even one dollar should make you happy. Uh, you greedy fuck. <laughs> uh, so sorry for the language. <laughs> I think everyone's over 18. Uh, but, but you're being irrational, but it tells just a lot of things about who you are, and, and only about reading that can you find this pattern everywhere around you. Some of it is going to be about fairness, it's going to be about how you compensate your team, it's going to be about how your customer perceive you. Do they perceive you as being too profitable a company? I've heard that about Credio in the past, and it's something that's puzzling me. Does it do what, it want, what you want it to do? People care about that, of course, but they care about, about how, they care about are you making money off of my back, are you, are you trying to, you know, Con me or in any way, I think, and I think they should care about this. And and in reading this seemingly random piece of trivia about what psycho how psychology works and how money interacts with people, you can actually find patterns and and ask yourself how I tweak how I present my product and my behavior to others through that. That's personally my process. I it's the one therefore I tell my team about, but I'm open to new ones. Awesome. Um, just wrapping up before we have a quick Q&A, uh, last question is, do you have any advice for people looking to break into product management? Uh, I, I can tell you about, actually I didn't say that at the beginning, but uh, I have a weird story for most PMs, which is that I started with the equivalent of the mailroom for a tech company, which is uh, working, selling a product to small businesses. Uh, so that's the Google Ireland of Critio. Um, and uh, and working there, I think, taught me a few things. And I'm not saying you should go there. I'm saying you should wonder what you have in your life that resembles it. Um, taught me to look at things in a completely different way and to look for lessons and to look at, at how those lessons might be surprising to people. I think if you walk into an interview and you can surprise the person on the other side of the table, you've done a good job showing them that you actually can be a good PM. Uh, interviews that go very smoothly, I do not like, because they tell me that that person is probably boring um, and probably will look at things in a very model type of way, right? I have five things I do. And then they do those five things and if no answer, comes out of those five things, they will move on, and, and that scares me. So I want, I want people that can find surprising stuff. Uh, there's a, a girl on my team the other day, she came up with something, it's gonna, not going to be a surprise to sometimes most of you, uh, but she said, well, I think our product is not uh, marvelous enough. It's not, that's not a word, it was in French, but that was the idea. I think our product doesn't pop. And I'd never thought of it this way. I was very surprised. It was, it's boring. It's marketing, right? And, and I realized that when she said it, that she touched on an, an interesting truth that wasn't in the process that we use that asks, 
are we solving our, problems, our clients' problem? And then I found the truth that I had in my dilemma from earlier, which is people have feelings and irrational things that come to them, and, and my, team, my teammates bring that to me. Um, to me, so, so first off, I want to acknowledge the truth that it's really, really hard to get into PMing. I think uh, there's lots of people who want to get into PMing. There's uh, not that many companies out there. And, and it, there's a bit big catch-22. Every company will want you to have PM experience, and no company will give you PM experience. So how do you kind of like problem solve this thing, right? So you kind of have to hack your way around it. Um, by the way, everything I kind of say on this topic is mostly related to my experience in the Bay Area and San Francisco and Silicon Valley. Um, I've been here like since the beginning of the year, so I kind of sense that there is similar patterns here. I think it applies as well. Um, but the two big ways I think of is either you're lucky enough out of school, you get admitted into one of the APM programs that a few key companies do, like Google and Facebook and maybe Airbnb and Asana now. But like there's really few and they only pick people from like Stanford and MIT and like whatever, right? Or you manage to transfer within a company. That's usually the two common paths that I see, right? And oftentimes that transfer happens, you, you kind of have to have the right conditions and so um, oftentimes it's like a growing company and so there's a lot of needs and lots of problems to be solved and lots of white space and you kind of like show within that that you can provide a lot of the value. Uh, oftentimes coming from roles where either you know the product really well, uh, could be an engineer, it could be, or e even a designer, uh, or you really know the market, the customers really well, like customer success or support or something. Um, and, and, and within that, you need to have kind of like whoever's leading the product organization to be willing to take transfers, right? And I've worked with people who say, no, I only take experience PM, like kind of that's the hard rule, right? So even if you're in that fast growing company and you kind of match the skills and all that, and suddenly they hire a VP product and the VP product is like, no, I can't afford, I just need experienced people, then what are you gonna do, right? So I, I, I don't wanna say that to despair people if you're not into PM and you want to get into PM. Uh, we've all been there. Like there's no training to become a PM. Like you, you don't go to school and become a PM. Uh, but, but that's kind of like the two main paths and, and how I think about them. On top of that, then there's stuff you can do even if like your company doesn't allow for that or you, you can, I'm, I'm sure it, it happens that you get hired as a PM in a company even though you haven't been a PM before. But I think you can always have side projects or have an interesting story of, or stuff that relates to the PM skill specifically that kind of like show and display that yes, you've, you're kind of, you, you have those skills and you can do it. Mm, yeah, I, I completely agree with the, the, the fact that you need to really hack your way into PM. There's no, like, we do, in France mostly we don't have associate program manager uh, program, so um, I mean, from my experience, what actually worked was to start small, so get in a, a young company without any product and then just build the product team there. Uh, it actually worked very well for me. Um, and, um, and I think another advice maybe is just talk a lot with PMs. I think there's a, now a growing community of PMs in, in France, in Paris. And PMs are mostly passionate about product. They know, a lot of them know each other. So one good way to enter product management is just to know a lot of product managers. All right, thanks everyone. Um, do we have time for a couple of Q and A? Okay, great. So does anybody have any questions? It's a microphone. Yeah. Okay, great. Um, really strange. Uh, I would like to continue on the two last question because I'm in the process of uh, finding a job in PM. I already have, but I'm looking for. And I see in job interview, they are looking at um, very specific uh, skills, but crazy because you have 200 competitors for each PM interview. It's true. 
I uh, ask, and it's true. So you have to be beyond these 200 people. And my question is, well, it was for the context. My question is, uh, what in your um, in your uh, journey makes the difference for your upper management, and what makes the difference um, in your day-to-day -day management of your team and working with your team, not honestly uh, management, but there is a lot of generic stuff. I really want to touch on what makes you the best above the 400 people who could do the job instead of you. So really detail um, aspect what makes you the best for this job. In your company, it can be a lot of things, but soft skills are skills. Can you be very specific on that? Yeah. I, I mean, I would go back to a lot of the answers before. Is like the job's going to be different for every company. And so I think with the one company or the company that you're talking to at the uh, at this moment when you're interviewing, like you really want to get to like, what do they need? What are they looking for? What do they value, right? Do they need, do they have a consumer product? It's really important that like you have a design affinity and you can talk design or like their enterprise and it doesn't matter as much. Or like, is it really important that, you know, in some cases at Credo, you need to be able to understand the algorithms, I'm sure in some of the positions, right? And so it's kind of a, you know, company by company, like the job's gonna be different and the expectations gonna be different. And so I think the best you can do is like try to read through, uh, and when I say read, sometimes it's just, you know, asking the question. It's like, what do you value in PMs? How am I gonna be evaluated? How am I gonna be assessed? And, and, and how are you gonna look for that? I understand for this part of the interview, but I really want to know what you value, uh, your team value and your upper management value in you. In, in me specifically or yes. in a PM? Yes, yes, in ah, you specifically. in me specifically. Wow, that's a tough question, yeah. man. <laughs> On the spot right there. Um, Be because as you guys talking, we can already see some qualities. Uh, you synthesize really well the, the question uh, you are asked for. Uh, you seem to have uh, value in certain area like business, analytics. You seem to have uh, uh, knowledge about uh, synthesized lot of data, but I think there is a lot of value your team need in you and your upper management uh, see in you and let you keep the job or grow. So I really want uh, to touch on that, please. Yeah, hopefully I'm still around by the end of the year. Um, I think the, so, so in my current role, so very specific to Algolia and me as a head of product, I think my, my mission is to really build, create, empower the right product team to make us successful, right? So back to the the company vision and strategy, right? And there's kind of like three ways that I think about it. One is the team. Is do we have the right people? Uh, so it's part hiring. It's part also coaching and training the team and growing the team and, and making sure they're on a path on a successful career, even if it's eventually outside of Argolia, yeah. having the right tool set, having the right knowledge, sharing within the team and all that. The other one is execution. It's you have a team and they kind of have their scope and all that, but like how do we execute with high quality and fast repeatedly? Like what are the processes, what are the key things that we do and how do we agree with each other? That goes all the way from like planning, we talk OKRs, planning week, to like we have a product process, you know, our way to agree on who's the customer, who's the problems and all of that. We've got a system of product review. There's like multiple ways, uh, processes, tools that we use to work together. And, and my role is to constantly kind of like both create that and fine tune it so that sometimes you feel like, hey, we're moving too fast and not enough rigor and we need to be talking more about these things or like we're too rigorous and, and need to move faster and so the processes need to be lighter. And the last part, which is the most important part and, and I, I maybe should have started with this one is strategy, right? You've got the right team to execute on the job and, you've, you, and you're ready to execute because you, you've got the right way of working together, but where are you going, right? And, and, and that's probably the hardest one, but like being clear around, this is where we're going, product strategy, this is how it relates to the company strategy, how it's gonna help it, and, and this is where we're not going, right? Uh, this is, and which is a core tenet of strategy, is like not just defining where we're going, but like all of the things that we're not gonna be doing and being very clear for the team. So that's kind of how I think about my job, uh, but I think it'd be interesting for you to ask that to our founders, so you have their actual answers of what the value in me. 
I think so. I wasn't hired as a PM, so it's a different different thing. Um, I I think. I think most of my bosses since then, they kind of walked into their office and were like, ah, you're here, right? They didn't hire me, they didn't, and they learned to see what I could bring. I think what they value with me is that I'm very opinionated and I often disagree with them. Uh, I don't know if it's too often that's for them to say. Um, I think, I think most of, I think the good ones, they, what they care about is I want, you know, this, the famous, if you're, if you're dumb, surround yourself with smart people. If you're smart, surround yourself with smart people who disagree with you. I think that kind of holds, especially for the upper echelon of management. But that doesn't help you with your hiring question. I think the hiring is about the filtering, it's not about what makes you satisfying, and I think it's different about what they like you then, after they've hired you. Yes, it was too bad, but uh, I want to know Yeah, okay. For, for the hiring, analytical, that's my... That's the part that I cannot be bothered to teach to people, so they better know it when they come in. And for the day-to-day? -day? Sorry, just a, nice. just, just a soft um, time check, because I'm sure people need to, <laughs> need to leave. Um, but we will, yeah, if there's, are there, Another. Are there other questions? Um, okay, cool. Hi, uh, I have a very specific question. I was wondering how, in your different organizations, you prioritized the very small features, like uh, what we call evolves, just like tiny features, where it, where typically uh, feedbacks from customers. How do you incorporate them in your roadmaps, um, tribes, squads? Poorly. <laughs> cool. Um, no, we we actually have kind of a. Uh, written down process to handle this, which we call quick wins. Uh, but basically what we do is we we allow for some bandwidth in the quarter to tackle those uh, those quick wins or small features. And then it's just a matter of priority. I mean, that's really where the, the PM has all power on this. Like he's discussing day-to-day uh, -day with, the, with the, the stakeholders or et cetera, and they discuss whether or not it's actually a quick win and if it makes sense to to take this bandwidth for this. Yeah, I mean, I, I'd say pretty similar, although we don't really have a process defined, but like each team kind of figures out their goals and it could be, oftentimes you find a case that there's one or two big kind of initiatives or projects uh, and then trying to keep space for like, you know, quick win stuff you can do that don't need to go through the process and no, that are no brainers. I've also worked with teams, you know, you can set up teams where you go, you know, our mission is to really make the product a bit more delightful in and, and this way or that way, and we're only going to be cranking on quick wins, right? That's our mission as a team, right? So that's one thing you can possibly set up, right? We don't have that currently at Avon yet, though. So thank you for all the advice. Um, it's all about like a structured team and we are in the process of creating our own product team and I was wondering what would be your best advice for somebody creating the team, what mistake we can avoid. If it's the first time, I would say it, it, either don't define stuff too much, be very vague, or define them entirely. But something that's in between, I think, is tougher to walk back from. Let's assume you, you put something in place that's half design and it doesn't take, as we would say. Like people are not agreeing and they are they're always questioning who should make decisions, who should prioritize and those things. If if that's not taking, then you need to quickly pivot. And you can only quickly pivot if you've ever either poorly defined stuff or defined them entirely and you say, okay, these are the things we're gonna change. If you're in between, it's going to be awkward, and no one is going to know when it's actually solidified, and it's actually now the new normal. So that's my best. Two things. Embrace the mistakes. You're going to fail hard, and that's OK. And that's part of the journey, and, and, and that's how we get there. I, my first year and a half as a PM, when I look back, complete failure. I made all the mistakes, all the stuff you read in the books. Like I, I felt them deep in my heart. Second thing is talk to people. Talk to people who have been there. Keep doing that. 
make space for it like proactively on your calendar and reach out and, like you know every two weeks get a coffee with someone different and get multiple points of views. Any other questions? Hi. Um, I, so I've worked in previous iOS products and one issue that I constantly have uh, experienced and uh, wanted to get your input on was uh, KPIs. Uh, so specifically, how do you guys organize your KPIs and share those with the team? Um, and uh, secondly, when do you know when it's a good time to stop looking at that KPI or uh, maybe pivot and, and change directions a little bit with it? So it's, we haven't figured it out uh, fully, but the thing, like the strong convictions that we have on KPIs is that you, uh, first you shouldn't have too much KPIs, you should focus on one KPI and even if it's biased, if in, even if it's there's, it doesn't encompass everything, just stick to it and try to understand it as much as you can. Um, so that's the first thing and you should really share it uh, so that everyone understand it uh, and that means for us, for an, I've talked about the North Star metric, we try to make it uh, to, to communicate as much as possible. Every team has to communicate on its North Star metric with the dev so they should understand That's what like we are. like a Google Doc, for example, or like? Oh. Uh, well, we, we mostly use uh, Amplitude, again, to follow the, those, uh, those KPIs. Uh, we have uh, for NPS, et cetera, not, not usage metrics, we have what we call weekly business reviews, which where you have all of the KPIs and you can actually follow them. But uh, uh, it really depends on the, on, the, on the teams and the actual KPIs. But most importantly is don't have too much and communicate with the team. Like we talk about them at all demos, et cetera. Uh, it's really important for everyone to be empowered. All right, I think that's all the time we have for questions today. Thank you to our panelists for their time. Thank you for attending. And Louis mentioned, well, thanks. Uh, Louis mentioned it before, we are hiring PMs, so come talk to either one of us afterward, Louis. And um, it's, a, yeah, it's, and there's a few PMs, Algolia PMs. It's an exciting time to join. We just raised our Series C, 110 million. We're all very excited about it, so thank you.